you've talked about U.S. as the center of innovation in other forums. Uh, I'd love your views on that and what, uh, what else you see evolving, if anything, and what we need to do to keep it this way. Um, and then maybe uh, we can end up what we were just talking about, your views on Europe. <laughs> well, the U.S. represents about 5% of the global population, and that's a declining percentage. And yet, although it's hard to put a number on it, we probably represent somewhere in excess of 60% of the innovation. And so if we want to retain that sort of high disproportionate share, I'd say there's two strategies. One is to increase our innovation, and the other is to decrease their innovation. Um, now, <laughs> the second element, they've done quite handily to themselves until fairly recently. And recently, they seem to be copying the good parts of what goes on in the US universities that work very well, and government research grants, and willingness to do big engineering projects. More and more, the things that have made the US unique, other countries look at and copy. And the thing that's completely unfair is that they don't copy our medical costs, our legal costs, uh, Amtrak, our post office, our political system. Um, and we should, have, we should have bundled these things together and said, look, if you're going to copy the good stuff, you've got to copy the bad stuff, too. <laughs> because otherwise, it's like an unfair advantage that you're getting, where you have our universities, but you don't have our medical costs. You don't have our defense costs, our legal costs. And you know, it's kind of embarrassing. And it might mean that our 60% share would go down. Now, in a sense, the 60% share is kind of unnatural. These things don't erode rapidly. I mean, if you take the top 20 universities in the world, you can argue, um, other than, say, the US and the UK, are there zero, two, or three, one, two, or three universities in the top 20 in the world that are non-US, UK universities? Is Xinhua in that top 20? I say yes. Other people say no, but it's you know, right on the boundary right now. And that's kind of amazing, because again, even if you stick the British in, we're like 6% of the world's population. So they really messed up for a long time. Um, and we kind of got used to the fact that the other people have, have messed up. And so nationalism is a very scary thing to me. You know, when people say, OK, should we put tariff on our wonderful you know, our energy market? We should have these tariffs. Well, our energy market is a very small part of the global energy market. We're not adding net much capacity in this country, whereas the Chinese and other countries are adding capacity. And so there is this sort of implicit chauvinism that historically we've always been the, the biggest market for advanced products. And now we're not the biggest market for advanced products in almost every market, whether it's computers, software, medicine. And so the idea that co-locating the research, the companies, the customers, that that created these clusters of innovation that, that bootstrapped, it, some of those elements aren't there any longer. And so if we take a nationalistic view, I think we handicap ourselves. And you know, I'm a, I'm a globalist in the sense of my foundation, uh, you know, we spend $4 billion a year uh, to try and improve things. And about 80% of that is spent on the poorest in the world, <coughs> not in the United States. It's those third who are in the, the toughest condition. And, you know, that's sort of an anti or opposite of a nationalistic viewpoint. 